Welcome. Very nice to see uh, such a full hall. I'm Jonathan Leap. I'm the Executive Director of the International Growth Center, and I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs for today's lecture. Many academic researchers aspire to inform public debates and to change public policy, but few succeed because the challenges are immense. There are conflicting cultures, conflicting time frames, incentives, constraints. Jeffrey Sachs was one of the first, and arguably the most prominent, in a new generation of leading economists who became not only policy intellectuals, but also public intellectuals, who have challenged policymakers and all of us to see pressing national and global issues in a new light to consider new approaches to seemingly entrenched problems. He's not, never shied away from being provocative and from taking risks. And the effect again and again has to been to take issues out of the closed domain of internal policy processes and negotiations very often with vested interests and into the public debate, challenging participants to make their case on the grounds of public interest. <coughs> For this reason, it's a special pleasure to welcome Jeff back uh, to the LSE. As many of you may know, the LSE was founded uh, in the late 19th century by the Fabians with the express aim of applying the emerging social sciences to the pressing social and economic problems of the day, very much in the spirit of what Jeff has devoted his career to doing. But it's also a great pleasure for me personally to uh, welcome him here on behalf of the International Growth Center. The International Growth Center is, was set up to promote sustainable growth in developing countries by bringing in new thinking and new ideas. And doing this by creating a new model, a model that brings together a global network of leading researchers from around the world and a set of 15 established country teams that make it possible for us to work collaboratively with policymakers. That is to recognize that policymakers are not only decision makers and implementers, but they're also knowledge creators. And we as researchers need to engage with policymakers directly if we're going to be able to generate frontier research that can critically inform policy. Although he needs no introduction, let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, about Jeff's background. He's currently the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, where he's been since 2002. He's the Quetelet Professor of Sustainable Development at Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs and also Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia's School of Public Health. And among many, many other affiliations, he directs the UN Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network. In the public sphere, he's perhaps best known for his contributions to the Millennium Development Goals. Following a summit at the UN uh, in the early 2000s, he was asked to launch and head something called the Millennium Project, which over three years, at the request of the Secretary General, developed a plan of implementation for the Millennium uh, Development Goals, which, as you know, were then adopted and have had an enormous uh, impact. He's also known for his work as economic advisor to governments in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and the former Soviet Union, but also in Africa, where he was worked with the Clinton administration to set up the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. It's hard to imagine anyone who is better placed uh, to talk to us today about the challenges of sustainable development. Two quick announcements. Uh, the hashtag for today's lecture, as you can see there, is LSE Sachs. Uh, we will have time for questions uh, at the end of the lecture, and there'll be roving mics, so please wait for those. And finally, uh, Jeff has agreed uh, to sign copies of his book after the lecture outside there on the lower ground floor foyer immediately following the lecture. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Sachs. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. I love the hashtag. Uh, can, I keep the ha can I keep the hashtag afterwards? Uh, 
I think many people uh, here know uh, that LSE is just one of my favorite places in, in, in the whole world. We're very proud, uh, Jonathan, of what you're accomplishing with the IGC and, and its uh, great efforts. And also one of my dearest friends and, and gurus, uh, Richard Layard here, uh, world great economist and thinker and friend and uh, wonderful compatriot in uh, many adventures. Uh, and also uh, who kindly brought me here 24 years ago for the Lionel Robbins lectures, which was one of the most uh, enjoyable, exciting moments of my life, uh, those three days to recount the drama of Poland's uh, transition uh, at, uh, at that time. So I love being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation and the chance to talk about what's really pressing us now. And that is a both a uh, really an existential challenge for the world. And you've already heard I have a title, complete bias in this issue of sustainable development, uh, because I believe it is the defining concept of our time. And I'm going to try to make the case. But also, this year, we have an absolutely packed diplomatic agenda that's either going to make this concept real or relegated to footnotes of uh, Brundtland Commission 1987, because this is the year when sustainable development can really become something deeply meaningful as a guide for changing the global direction. Or we might miss the opportunity, because this is a very complicated world and a mess of a time, in which case I don't think this opportunity is going to come back again. 2015 happens to be a pivotal moment for negotiations on adopting sustainable development goals. And I'm going to try to explain why I think that they're really so important. So we're in not only a new period of history, multipolar, end of Cold War, however you want to say it, not only a new phase of geopolitics, we're actually in literally a new geologic epoch. The concept of the Anthropocene, meaning the epoch of humanity, Anthropocene, meaning specifically that we have left the Holocene, that rather comfortable period from 10,000 years ago when agriculture got started, to sometime recently that was the era in which we built civilization, the geologists are telling us we're in something new. We've actually transited from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. Now, when Paul Crutzen, the Nobel laureate, who was one of the three discoverers of the ozone depletion effect, coined this term a dozen years ago, my guess is, and I have to ask Paul about it, but my guess is that he meant it as a metaphor, that humanity has become so large relative to the size of the planet that we can change the climate, we can change the ocean chemistry, and so forth. But the International Geophysical Union, the American Geophysical Union, other geologic societies have taken it up. Maybe he didn't mean it as a metaphor. Have taken it up as a literal concept to ask a question. If you apply the same criteria for dating the end of the Pleistocene and the beginning of the Holocene, for example, and you apply the same criteria of stratigraphy and of other changes of Earth processes, would you say we're in a new era? And the answer is yes. That's not a happy moment, by the way. Uh, this is not, yay, humanity. This is, oh my god, what are we doing? And that's really the message. We began kind of to know this 43 years ago when uh, three great events happened in one year. Uh, one was the UN Conference on Environment and Development in Stockholm, which said environment and development need to be brought together. The second great event was the publication of Limits to Growth, which said it's possible to overshoot the Earth's ecosystems. The third great event is I became a freshman at Harvard, uh, and, I began to, and I began to study economics. That was only a personal great event, but it was a great event. 
And actually, the first book that I was assigned was Limits to Growth. How many here know that book, by the way? This is LSE, you know, it's unfair. If I said this at most places, all hands would stay down because uh, it's really forgotten, uh, even though it is a, a great uh, work. Not great in every modeling aspect and every technical issue, but great in noting the basic premise, which is stated right at the beginning of the book, which is if you have exponential growth and a finite earth, you're going to hit a problem. Now, that was first noted by whom? Exactly that problem. 1798 principles of population. Malthus said geometric growth, finite, uh, arable, you got a problem. And we were assigned the book in 1972 to say there was this crazy guy Malthus who got it all wrong because just when he was writing the world took off and everything went well and now they're writing it again, this Malthusian doom and it's not like that. If there's scarcity, there'll be a rise of prices, then there will be innovation and so forth. And maybe that will be the end of the story a hundred years from now. But the reason why we're here is that it's not automatic. We really could ruin things. And by the way, if you have any doubt of it, almost every time humanity entered a new place, it ruined things before. And the poor Native Americans who ended up on the disastrous side of history after 1492 ruined things, unfortunately for them, when they came to uh, the Americas, uh, we don't know, but maybe uh, 12,000 BP or 14,000 BP. And when it started to warm up a little bit, one of the first things they did was drive to extinction all of the large land mammals, including the horses. This was a very bad idea because from then on for the next 12,000 years roughly, they didn't have any animal traction except if you happen to live up in the Altiplano of the Andes. But there were no horses. And then, damn it, came the Spaniards and they had horses. And they could kill everyone that they wanted to. And then, uh, not just the Spaniards, let's do all of Europe for that matter, uh, arrived and it was a very bad scene. Same thing happened in Australia, same thing uh, happened in other new entries. Humanity does not have a natural stopping point necessarily to say we've had enough. And we're at that moment now in a very different way. All previous extinction events, all previous environmental crises were local or regional affairs. Now we're in the Anthropocene. We're at the global scale. There is no backup, except if you love the idea of extraterrestrial uh, migration, which is not, I think, a great idea for the problems over the next 20 years. Uh, I think we are going to have to do better than that. The starting point of the Anthropocene is definitely this machine. Uh, it all began in Britain, as almost everything about the modern world did. Uh, it began with James Watt. It began with the absolutely wonderful, ingenious uh, recognition, actually with Newcomen, but then with the Watts uh, condenser, that we could use solar power buried in the ground, sequestered over 100 million years in the form of coal. Uh, that is uh, plant, and, uh, plant and animal, uh, with the case of oil and gas, plant and, and uh, animal carbon uh, that was uh, deposited and transformed into fossil fuels and that this could be the basis for motive force, for transport, for mechanical operations, for uh, industrial transformation. And everything in the world changed. And if you're in class studying was there an industrial revolution or not, the answer is yes, not no. Uh, and uh, if you want to know was the central invention of the Industrial Revolution the spinning jenny or the mule or uh, the uh, textile revolution, no, it was this. It was the ability of mega transformation of energy which changed everything because all work that we need to do in the world, whether it's making steel and construction or whether it's uh, any other kind of industrial transformation or running all of those uh, wonderful spinning 
uh, Jenny's requires energy and the trees of England were not enough. And England was deforesting and coal became the key to the modern world. And everything changed. And this is uh, the truth of the world. All curves look like this in economics, uh, in uh, about uh, economic development. And of course, if you're studying economic history, this part is fascinating. I don't want to say that there isn't a lot of micro wealth to what brought uh, James Watt to Glasgow with the know-how to do that, because maybe it was Newton, and maybe it was 1492, and maybe it was antecedents, maybe it was the Glorious Revolution. But the steam engine was the moment of transformation that was absolutely fundamental. And this is why we have the Anthropocene. And this is what you get if you take Angus Madison's data and divide it by Angus Madison's population estimates in terms of per capita income. And roughly speaking, we have two orders of magnitude growth of the world economy, one order of magnitude growth of the world population since Malthus wrote, and one order of magnitude increase of output per person since the start of the industrial era. So it's the big driving change. And it's really quite wonderful, except all curves look like this. And an, another curve that looks like this is CO2 concentrations. Everything changed with coal. And who knew? Who knew of the side effect? And it's interesting, actually, uh, already back in 1824, we started to know with Fourier. And then by the 1840s to 1860s, we knew a lot better about uh, the greenhouse effect, the thermal balance, and uh, even the spectral absorption of CO2. And in 1896, Svant Arrhenius, who was a very, very clever chemist, Nobel laureate, who worked out with paper and pencil what a doubling of CO2 would do. It took him 18 months, and he nailed it that a doubling of CO2 concentrations would raise temperatures by, say, 3 degrees uh, C. But even Arrhenius got wrong the compound rate of growth because he said the world is producing and using coal enough to double CO2, but it's going to take about 750 years. And he didn't anticipate Deng Xiaoping. He didn't anticipate the diffusion of economic growth widely. And it turns out that it's going to happen in about one-fifth of the time that Arrhenius estimated. So we're now on a trajectory of doubling the CO2 concentration from the pre-industrial level of 280 ppm parts per million to maybe 500, 550, 560 <coughs> ppm by the middle of this century. Last year, we reached 400 parts per million. And we know that everybody knows, except for Rupert Murdoch land, that uh, this is real. And uh, if you happen to live in Rupert Murdoch land, you may know that it's a hoax. But the rest of the world, uh, all of us human beings, uh, are experiencing, uh, we're experiencing warming, we're experiencing droughts, we're experiencing floods, we're experiencing dra dramatic events. Now, by the way, the problem of addressing climate change is not about public opinion, even in America, which is definitely one of the world's weirdest places. Uh, there was just a poll last week released by Pew, interesting and online, showing that about 65% of Americans think that climate change is serious and government should do something about it. I said to myself, what a breakthrough. This is wonderful. Went to look at the poll, and it showed the numbers are basically flat for the last 15 years that Americans have always believed this. And yet we haven't acted on it almost at all. Why? Because politics, not because of opinion. Because our democracies are not aggregators of public opinion, especially in the United States. 
We do not have the median voter model. We have the median billionaire model. It's true. Everything is skewed to the right several degrees, C, because <laughs> they are cold-blooded, by the way. <laughs> and they are breaking our politics and breaking our government. And the two Koch brothers who just promised to put in a billion dollars into the next election own the world's largest privately owned oil company. And so this is the reality, not the public opinion. So all curves look like this, and that's why we are in the Anthropocene. Now, the steam engine was followed by waves of technological change. Another thing I learned in 1972 was don't take notice of the Kondratiev ideas, and it took me about 30 years onward to learn that that was yet another thing wrong that I was taught uh, back in, uh, in uh, 1972. Kondraty of long technology cycles are real, they're important, they're crucial for understanding economic development. We've been through several long cycles, and we're in another cycle right now of information, technology, and the digital revolution. And it's a very deep and exciting and promising and disruptive technology cycle as well. But it's that accumulation of cycles <laughs> that leads to this remarkable uh, uh, rise of output and the remarkable threats to the planet. Our immediate curve looks like this. This is the transistor count on Intel chips. This is Moore's law, graphically. The curve looks just the same. This is the doubling time of 18 to 24 months for Intel's doubling of chips. Back in 1961, uh, Noyce uh, brilliantly etched two transistors into a, a silicon chip, and last year Intel put five billion of those transistors on the chip. And that has led to the revolution that we have right now. It has led to what I think many consider to be the absolute highest flowering of civilization imaginable, and that is that you can stream movies on your phone. I mean, it's hard to imagine anything beyond that, actually, but I'll, tr I'll try to suggest a couple of things. But um, this is the revolution that we are in today. And it's leading to a development revolution as well, in my view. So this is mobile phone coverage, which went from basically zero, because the technology wasn't there, to a few tens of thousands around 1980 to 7 billion mobile subscribers now, including in all the villages where we work in the most remote areas of the world. And my wife uh, and I experienced just uh, absolute proof that uh, the whole world is connected. We were up at uh, about uh, 4,000 meters uh, in uh, a little mountain pass in Bhutan a couple of years ago, and we were at a monastery and the monks uh, from the youngest child up to the elder monk were praying uh, with the scriptures, the, the scrolls, and the senior monk saw us and came out in his saffron robes, and we, the stars were all there in the Milky Way, and suddenly, and he reached into his robes to take a call on his galaxy. And you realize this world's absolutely connected. There's no doubt, there's no place that isn't. I believe this makes possible everything we want to do in development. Ending poverty, providing health, and all the rest. And all this talk, by the way, about secular stagnation, blah, 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 is complete nonsense. Or Robert Gordon, who I like a lot, that somehow we've lost the technology development and we've got to slow down. The digital age of Turing and von Neumann and Kilby and Noyce is as fundamental a technology transformation as we've ever had with the possible exception of Watt and the inventors of agriculture. Because everything that we do is based on information and whether it's going to be AI or robotics and all the rest, 
we have a very profound revolution at hand that's extremely positive if we use it right. By the way, every technology can be used wrong. We can end up with a totalitarian, all-surveillance state. We can end up with complete disaster. We can end up with cyber warfare. We can end up with everything. Or we could actually use this technology to solve the problems that we have. So there's no technology determinism, but there is a technology opportunity that's really profound. The rate of development, therefore, has accelerated enormously. This is Shenzhen, uh, just outside of Hong Kong, looking over the fields in 1980. Same view, fast forward, literally. That is one generation. You can't make this stuff up, by the way. This was 23,000 people, farmers, in 1980. And it's now about 23 million people in a metropolitan area today. So the rate of transformation that is possible is absolutely unbelievable. The world is fundamentally changing. Global scale production systems, ICT enabled technology, rapid population dynamics, <coughs> both aging in the, old, in, uh, the uh, high income countries and continued rapid growth in Africa. Uh, there's massive <laughs> churning of the labor market. I believe a, 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 I do believe that technology is driving the uh, rapid decline of demand for labor for certain large categories of work and that this is quite fundamental and very complex, by the way, to analyze whether it's good or bad. And it would be good to work on economic models. What if robots can do everything? What kind of world is that? Is that the great world, is that the miserable world where no one has a job? Or is that the great world where everyone has endless leisure? And it's actually interesting, the transition paths, because both are possible in such a changing world. But that is the kind of change that I think is underway. But because of that growth that is based on fossil fuels, land use, water claims and so forth, we are in an unprecedented environmental crisis. And because of the diffusion of technological capacity, we're in a highly multipolar world. That is good on the one hand because we want a diffusion of capacity and responsibility. It makes it hard to agree on anything. And we've got so many wars going on because we're bloody minded. And so we're not very good at managing multipolarity also. But we know from history, for instance, the, uh, the history of uh, the long 19th century of Europe, it's actually possible to tamp down the violence for a very long time. And we should be working much harder to do that and get agreements right now. Poverty is coming down sharply. I wrote a book in 2005 that said we could end extreme poverty by 2025. I think it would have been possible then. The world is actually adopting the formal date of 2030 because SDG number one will be end extreme poverty by 2030. Good idea. Absolutely achievable. We're down to about 17, 16 percent poverty rate in the low in, in the developing world from what was about 43 percent according to World Bank estimates in 1990. But we are not achieving sustainable development. So I have to define the term. What is sustainable development? Sustainable development is development that is socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. And we are not achieving that kind of development now. And there are basically uh, several reasons for that. First, there is growing income inequality and social exclusion, including the hard, very difficult regions of poverty like the Sahel or the Horn of Africa that are not getting out of this mess. They're falling into violence, into crisis, uh, and into uh, geopolitical proxy wars. Second, we will not achieve sustainable development as long as the world population continues to rise rapidly and it's still increasing at a rate of 75 to 80 million people per year.
That means that by 2024, we'll probably reach 8 billion, by 2040, 9 billion, and beyond. This has been very difficult to talk about because talking about high fertility rates has not been politically correct until two weeks ago when Pope Francis mentioned that being a good Catholic doesn't mean breeding like rabbits. <laughs> Comma, pardon the expression, said Pope Francis. Well, this was a good opening because I think the Pope would be a good place to start this discussion, and he did. And we need what he called responsible parenthood, which is to have the number of children you can raise in a healthy, well-educated way so that there's a chance for prosperity. And that means two or three children. It doesn't mean five or six or seven or eight children. So this remains a major challenge. Africa had how many people Sub-Saharan Africa in 1950, according to the UN data, for all of Sub-Saharan Africa, you'd be surprised to know, I feel a surprise each time I mention it, 180 million people only for all of Sub-Saharan Africa. It's now 1 billion today. And the UN medium fertility forecast is to reach 4 billion by the end of the century. I have no clue how you would achieve sustainable development with four billion people in sub-Saharan Africa. So at that point, sorry, I don't know how to do it. But at two billion, you can do it. But that means a rapid reduction of fertility rates. And that's not happening yet. And then finally, the environmental crises. I don't have time to go through the evidence of this but I do mention the social exclusion. I used to just add pictures to this chart till I ran out of room. Uh, youth unemployment, high income inequality, lots of unrest, lots of confrontation on the streets, <coughs> including in many of the world's major cities, including Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, <coughs> in 2011. Now, I love this picture, and I really recommend it from 2009. Who knows this picture? Okay, who doesn't know this picture before? Now you all know it, okay? <laughs> uh, go read this article by Johann Ruckström, 2009 Nature magazine. Uh, this is uh, the concept of planetary boundaries. It says we can identify dangerous thresholds across many ecological domains and we're at the risk or already have surpassed these thresholds. And at high noon is climate change, definitely the most dangerous of them all, and rapidly approaching. The world has agreed to a two degree C upper limit on warming, but we're on a business as usual trajectory of four degrees C, four to six degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial level. So we're ripping right past safety right now Nobody knows what the food supply would look like in a four to six degree C world, except everybody has reason to believe it would be a hell. Because water in the soils, with evapotranspiration rates much warmer than they are right now, with changes of the hydrologic cycle, with thermal stress, with rising sea levels, with the loss of biodiversity could devastate the global food supply, eh, with that rising population, not to mention it. So we have a huge, huge crisis. And if you go around the circle, what the ecologists did was to identify all of the threat points. Ocean acidification, carbon dioxide melting in the, I mean, dissolving in the ocean, the hydrogen proton, Concentration is already up 30% against the pre-industrial base, 30% acidity. That's just a drop of 0.1 in the pH level. But that's enough already to be threatening the corals, the shellfish, the phytoplankton uh, with their calcareous shells. In other words, the marine ecology at a quite fundamental level. We're on a path for a drop of pH of maybe 0.3 or 0.4. Could be devastating for marine ecologies. The circles here are the nitrogen and phosphorus loadings, 
which come from heavy fertilizer use to feed the planet, because we haven't figured out how to feed the planet, much less how to feed the planet nutritiously and not destroy ecology at the same time. And we know that agriculture is the number one anthropogenic sector of society. And we don't know what to do with groundwater. We don't know what to do with the biodiversity loss, with the habitat loss, with the massive loadings of phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen, and with the pesticides and the other pollutants that we're putting on the soils also. This is a scale problem that is massive. So energy systems, agriculture systems, fundamental. And we haven't figured that out yet. Well, it's a circle of mess. It looks like a bullseye with us in the middle, which is really the point, which is that we have not figured out how to grow and to be sustainable at the same time. And until we do, Malthus is there. He has not been proved wrong yet. He said we would raise population to, enough to uh, lower our living standards again. <coughs> well, we've raised the population. We did have this massive gain of productivity. We had rising living standards. We've had huge progress. And now we have to ask, can we sustainably live with the planet and keep the gains to production? Because Malthus said we wouldn't be able to do so. He's not been proved wrong yet. Now, we can prove him wrong in the same way as the past by being clever, smart, and attentive to the problems. But that we haven't also proved that we're ready to do. And wherever I went this past couple of years as part of the UN process of trying to negotiate sustainable development goals, it has been an unbelievable mess. And usually uh, I wasn't there for the floods, I was there the next week, say, in the Balkans, once in 500 year scale. Massive storms, unprecedented heat waves, we're seeing already all of this play out. This is California's water supply. By the way, I was in Brazil early this year, or early in 2014, sorry, a year ago. And uh, I said, what's going on? Oh, we have a massive drought in uh, Sao Paulo. I said, what's the public response? Shh, can't do anything. We have the World Cup coming. Can't say a word. And then the World Cup came and went and uh, still nothing. Why? Shh, we have elections coming up. Can't say anything. The elections came and went. Now there's water rationing, and you have the region of Sao Paulo in an absolute extreme water crisis. So the politicians also play their games, even in this completely imminent, known circumstance, they won't tell the truth. And that's a big problem. And that's, by the way, why universities are so important, because it's our job to tell the truth. That's how we get scored. Not by the votes we get, not by the money we make, alas, but by telling the truth. And that's the problem that we have right now. Massive drought all over the world. Check out the Middle East. Please appreciate that the disaster in Syria while it is a geopolitical disaster and another American intervention folly, is also an ecological disaster. Because there were 10 years of drought before the violence broke out. Food prices were soaring, populations were displaced. There was unrest, then a crackdown. Then America had the bright idea, well, we'll throw this guy out because that's what is called foreign policy in America is throw out someone you don't like or drop bombs on their head. Very clever. And now 200,000 Syrians are dead. But the ecological crisis that underpins this is extremely powerful. And we just had the warmest year in history. Except, damn, you see the blue up there? We had the coldest winter last year. <laughs> but by the way, not by coincidence, we had this polar vortex which according to my friends uh, at the Earth Institute, is part of the Rosby waves becoming more lopsided, moving less rapidly, trapping some regions in Arctic air, uh, 
uh, for a long period. We had that, but the rest of the world was sweltering at the same time. So sustainable development is the framework that aims to holistically address the economic, social, and environmental crises. And <coughs> the world's governments, for some wonderful reasons, have adopted this idea because they don't adopt so much together. And yet this idea they've adopted, that sustainable development should be the organizing principle for global development. And they've set 2015 as the year to do it. And by coincidence, two mega negotiations came together. One to adopt sustainable development goals, and the second to finally adopt a climate agreement that has proved to be elusive since 1992. We signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Kyoto was stillborn. Copenhagen was a debacle. And Paris is the last stop. And Paris is the last stop because no one's going to believe this process anymore unless an agreement is reached in Paris. And it's been six years to regroup since Copenhagen. And it's now. I've been saying 2015, 2015 as if it were the distant future. And now we have a few months to go to reach a serious climate agreement. And then a third summit was added on financing sustainable development in Addis Ababa in July. So three big summits this year. That third one was added because the developing countries said, so how are we going to pay for all of these wonderful goals? And the idea in Addis is to look at how private finance and public finance together, blended and in its discrete uh, ways, can be oriented away from the dangerous things like financing Arctic oil development, which is useless and unneeded, and financing renewable energy, which is absolutely what we need. So we'll adopt SDGs. The big struggle, which shouldn't be a struggle at all, is to get a list of 17 agreed goals down to a workable number from the point of view of public understanding and advocacy. I'm trying to urge that the number come down to 10 to 12 headline goals through just good wordsmithing. And I guess in German, it could all be just one long word, actually. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I think that the point is just advocacy to, uh, to, make this, to make this work. Now, what do we need to actually accomplish this? We need pretty fundamental systems changes. We need energy systems that go from a high carbon world, which by the way, you heard me very clearly, nothing is wrong with coal, oil, and gas, except for the damn side effects. They made the world without fossil fuels, no modern world, not even a chance. So this is the point. It's not that there's something intrinsically awful about fossil fuels, except for the fact that when you oxidize C, you get a greenhouse gas. That's all. So that's our problem. We have to move to a low carbon energy world in the next 40 years. We have to live within a carbon budget of about 1,000 billion tons of carbon dioxide emission. That means a drastic decline of CO2 because we're emitting 36 billion tons per year right now. We need a drastic decline <coughs> of emissions down to essentially net zero by 2070. That's what we call deep decarbonization going to zero net carbon by around 2070. Fundamental transformation. Everything about energy, everything about divestment, everything about what the energy companies are doing should be calibrated against a timeline to get to net zero by 2070. We have more than enough fossil fuel reserves to last us till then. There's a wonderful article by uh, Ekins uh, and McGlade of University College London in Nature magazine a couple of weeks ago that I highly recommend, which measures all the assets that need to be stranded 
of the coal, oil, and gas. Basically, 80% of the coal should never be produced, and about half the oil and, and, uh, should be stranded, and about 30% of the natural gas, uh, roughly speaking. We need resilient and sustainable agriculture. It's a very complicated topic because we have to feed people more nutritiously, we have to feed more people, but we have to stop the anthropogenic adverse effects of agriculture and to make agriculture resilient to the climate changes that are underway. It's a massive mess of a problem. It's not even mentioned most of the time in our daily day-to-day -day policy discussions. We need smart urban systems, ICT-based, because we're living in cities. And it's 54, 55 percent urban today in the world, and it will be 70 percent urban, say, by 2030, and the numbers will make an urban world <coughs> by mid-century that's overwhelming. And we need better health education and governance systems. And ICT should fundamentally change governance as well, not just that they spy on us, but actually we get to decide things again. And we could use ICT for deliberative decision making, group decision making, voting, and many other things in ways that were not possible before. So we should rethink governance for participation in a quite fundamental way that ICT can enable. Now, the last concept I want to mention is directed technical change. We need to move the world's systems in a deliberative way. In other words, not just as a self-organizing, expanding, endogenous growth system, but as a system that is controlled by moral, ethical ideas and purpose. That's unusual for economics. It's unusual for thinking about the free market and all the rest. We need to move in a direction of safety. We need to avoid the planetary boundaries. So we need directed technological change. And if one believes that technology doesn't work that way, technology does work that way. Because most of the great breakthroughs, especially in the last century, have been under the early patronage, at least, of the state, but typically the defense ministry or the defense department. And that's where great breakthroughs have come. Not only in the United States, we fund two basic things, war and health. And there, the health in NIH and so forth has been fundamentally transformative, unraveling the human genome. Absolutely phenomenal. My guess is that every congressman knows that their family members get sick. And so they fund NIH. And then they like to bomb other people also. Uh, and those are the two things they do for a living. Uh, other than collecting David Koch and Charles Koch's, Charles Koch's money. Other than that, I don't see the job exactly. But the point is, the great breakthroughs have come with a strong role of directed ideas. And you look at the great science, vaccines, medicines, diagnostics, radar, of course, was World War II. Cryptography started uh, right here uh, with, the, with the Turing. Uh, of course, the whole nuclear age. Uh, computing uh, was uh, uh, giving uh, funding to both Turing and then to John von Neumann so that he could simulate thermonuclear explosions uh, with computers. Semiconductors uh, was really Bell Labs, but then all the semiconductors virtually that were made for in the 1960s were bought by NASA to go to the moon. And so public procurement was a massive part of that. Satellite space science, the internet, of course, was a project to keep networked computers in the event of nuclear attack and so forth. And then it became an NSF project and so forth. And uh, human genome project, finding the Higgs boson, uh, the new brain initiatives, and so forth. It's not to say that there isn't an important role for a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates. There is, of course. But the fundamental transformations have come with fundamental investments by the state. And we have to choose, or the only thing we're going to do is better drones, better fighter, pi better fighter planes, cyber warfare, cybersecurity, and so forth, or are we actually going to invest in low-carbon energy systems, 
better agriculture, and so on. You'd be shocked at how little we actually invest in all of this. U.S. spending right now for health in the budget is about $30 billion per year. U.S. spending for renewable energy technology, under $3 billion per year. For what Nick Stern, Lord Stern, has told us is a fundamental trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars issue. We haven't invested properly in this up until now. When we do invest, we get really great results. This is uh, one of my favorite uh, illustrations of this. NIH made the Human Genome Project. At the end, by the way, as you know, Craig Ventner came in and uh, competed with the U.S. government, but building on the Human Genome Project fundamentally. And they closed the deal in 2000, uh, deciphered the genome at a cost of several billion dollars. Then in 2001, NIH brought everyone together, said, what do we do next? And there was a general consensus. To use this, we should reduce the cost from what was then estimated to be $100 million per human genome down to $1,000. That's a lot. That's 100,000x improvement, and they set the date for 2015. Now, Moore's Law, since this is a semi-log graph, is a straight line downward like that, and the <laughs> genome cost reduction absolutely wiped out Moore's Law because it was 13 years to get 100,000x improvement in cost. If you put your money in it, you can get somewhere. We're at the cusp of revolutionary breakthroughs in health, in education, in renewable energy, in smart systems, smart transport, robotics, artificial intelligence. Maybe someday just robots from 193 countries will talk to each other at the end and they'll actually have intelligence, artificial intelligence, but intelligence uh, that can get uh, the job done. We can all go to the beach or uh, go back to uh, our uh, quest for leisure. Um, but this is the revolution that we have available. I have run out of time because I wanted to spend a few minutes at least to uh, take some Q&A, except to say we need to make 2015 a fundamental success. It means adopting smart, strong guideposts for the world in the form of sustainable development goals this September. This will be the largest gathering of world leaders in history. They will actually spend three days at a summit on sustainable development. The summit will be opened by Pope Francis. It will be a very wonderful occasion. Before that, we need to make the financial markets, which are vast and could easily fund everything that needs to be funded, direct finance towards the areas that are needed and away from the areas that are dangerous. And in December, we need to reach a climate agreement that respects the two degrees Celsius upper limit and that takes seriously our planet and our future. Thank you very much. Five minutes. <laughs> we could push everything. Five, five or two. Okay. Well, the, the pressure. Yeah, the pressure's on. We only have time for three questions. Please make them very concise, um, and uh, I'll, I'll just choose people here, and then Jeff will wrap up with all of them. So just. Uh, do you think that sustainable development is uh, compatible with our current economic system we've got? Do we need an economic revolution, or can we? Um, adapt the current capital system we've got to, to suit sustainable got development. It. Yep. Thank you. Uh, another question? Okay, right there, the back, the, yes, the person, that's right, you uh, just hold your hand up, the one in the gray shirt <coughs> on the left. There you are. Thank Thanks. you. Hi there. What would do you say the price of carbon is going to be in five years' time? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then finally, over here, down in the front. Professor Sachs, great. Uh, lecture, you made a good case that corporate capture of politics is the key problem. What can academics and the finance system do about that? Great. Okay. Good. 
yes, 60, uh, and uh, social activism. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. No. All right. Um, very, very, very quick, <laughs> very quickly. Um, I am a social democrat uh, by political persuasion. Uh, social democracy is an idea that capitalism can exist uh, in an absolutely humane, decent, and productive manner. Uh, I take uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark to be the greatest exemplars of social democracy in the world. They are not blemish-free societies by any means. They have the same struggle of all of humanity that they're finding right now with their immigrant populations, with diversity and all the rest, which they have not had to face because they are ethnically homogeneous populations, uh, which gave them a base which is a different kind of social base for their politics. But they are examples of capitalism that absolutely, in my view, works for society, for inclusion, and for attention to environment. They're wonderful places. A lot of places are wonderful. I happen to love Scandinavia for what it has proven for how to have a decent life. We write with the Professor Laird. We edit, uh, co-edit together the World Happiness Report, third edition coming out uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, Denmark's always at the top. They're not only clean, green, productive, prosperous, but they're happy too. So that's great. So the answer is yes, capitalism can coexist with sustainable development, and we even have examples of it. Uh, now, uh, on the price of carbon, I would be quite uh, surprised if in the end we need more than $100 a ton long term in order to get this transformation, because we're seeing such dramatic improvements of technology. But we do need a corrective price. Pagu was right. There is uh, every reason for it. It could be a little bit higher, a little bit lower. All the calculations that I've made and that I've seen say to get to climate safety is 1% of world income annual to 2050 or less. If it's more than that, it's not m much more than that. In other words, this is a tiny amount for planetary safety. Like many things, this is not driven by the damned exigencies of needing heroism, it's because of neglect and powerful interests. And this is driven overwhelmingly by powerful interests. The oil companies are the most powerful lobby in the world. This month, less powerful than they were a few months ago because of falling oil prices. We need to raise our voice, period. Stop it. Stop wrecking the planet. Let's get serious. We need a transition path. We made a project this year called the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, DDPP. You can find it online. It shows how technologically this transformation can be made with a lot of interesting numbers and a lot of interesting options. How do we beat corporate capture? How do we beat corporatocracy? The United States has it the worst because we have a Supreme Court that failed to understand the difference of free speech and corporate bribes, basically. Uh, and uh, absolutely the most mind-bogglingly uh, inept Supreme Court that we have had in our history probably since the Dred Scott decision, uh, or uh, maybe uh, there were a few zingers in our history. But this, uh, this Citizens United was one of the stupidest, most pernicious decisions we've ever had. But America, everything is for sale, starting with the Senate. The interesting thing is that it doesn't cost much to buy the Senate, by the way. But if you start a bidding war, the Cokes will keep going up. So it will cost more. They just bought it for cheap because there was no one on the other side. So they bought this Senate. You just look at it. Just everyone needs their oil decal on their labels. Uh, or uh, uh, Mitch McConnell needs his coal across the forehead uh, because that's who owns this Senate. So this one is miserable. Uh, they voted against, they, they really voted against nature, against science, against everything. But they're just bought. They're not as dumb as they look. They're just lazy, lying, bought. Uh, but, but they're not so stupid, actually, uh, which is a good sign, I suppose. The Ameri the, actually, 
it's odd, but probably true. Uh, if they were really so stupid, I'd be even more worried than I am. We need candidates that can win without campaign contributions. That's the bottom line of it. Not you take your billionaire and I'll take my billionaire, or not I am a billionaire, I'll be your president. Sometimes like Berlusconi taking the shortcut, uh, which uh, is absolutely the worst disasters. Uh, but rather saying, I will take no money, my opponent is on the take, vote for me and you get somebody who's really looking after your interests, vote for them and them is everyone in our political scene right now. And all you're getting is corporate votes, not the public vote. Is this possible? That's what social activism is. The answer is yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>